Welcome to Rocking Our Prize. Today I'm joined by Joe Henrik, Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard, and we're discussing his new book, The Weirdest People in the World. Joe, welcome. Ah, good to be with you, Alice. <laughs> okay, so I want to structure this podcast into three parts. First, worldwide variation in psychologies. Second, the origins of weak kinship in Europe. And then three, thinking about the consequences of cultural and psychological differences for economic outcomes. And I'll play devil's advocate, challenging some of these claims. Okay? Okay, great. Awesome. Now tell me, so what evidence is there of worldwide psychological variation? Well, I first got interested in this uh, in about 2006, and we put together all the available evidence we could find at the time and had published this paper called The Weirdest People in the World with a Question Mark in 2010. And in that case, there was a wide range of different evidence. So uh, uh, behavioral economics games, ultimatum game, public goods games, uh, measures from psychology. So things like analytic versus holistic thinking seem to vary, at least among some societies, lots of measures related to individualism and the self measures related to conformity, a uh, number of different cognitive measures, facts about how people think about plants and animals varies, uh, and, and a lot of other kind of survey based evidence that seem to point in the same direction. In the last 10 years, the new evidence has come in and we can really double down. So in addition to the visual illusions that we could show varied in 2010, uh, things like how, whether people's sensitivity to different smells varies. Uh, we now know that aspects of human physiology vary, like things about feet, susceptibility to uh, various health conditions varies across populations. Um, and also just lots more evidence on behavioral games, cooperation with strangers, uh, lots more evidence on individualism, yeah, so there's a substantial case to be made that these things vary both across countries, but also the most interesting variation for me is the variation within countries. Can you tell me, um, right, so that picks up on your point about urbanization. Can one, tell, one thing that I found particularly lucid in your book is your distinction between guilt and shame. And can you contrast those two different societies for me? Yeah, so uh, I think the place to start is shame. And there's good reason to think that shame is a human universal. As far as we know, all societies experience something like shame. Uh, biological anthropologists have argued that there's a kind of proto shame that we see in non human primates. The physical posturing is when people make themselves small and hunch down and try to disappear from view. It seems to be elicited by two kinds of conditions across societies. One is when you're faced with a very dominant individual and you're basically appeasing them saying don't hit me. So you can imagine seeing that in non human primates as well as humans. And then when you violate community norms. So it seems to be a way of signaling to others in your community saying I understand I violated the norm. Please don't punish me too badly. I, I recognize what I've done. So that's, that's shame. Now, the other emotion, guilt, seems to be different in that it's about not living up to personal standards. So in a place in societies where there are fewer kind of tight norms that are regulating people's behavior, people want to set themselves apart. And, and appear unique. So they might want to cultivate, they might want to learn a foreign language or go to the gym a lot or uh, cultivate some other talent like kayaking. And uh, so uh, there's, you know, disciplines one has to do. And so you feel guilt when you don't live up to your personal standards. Now, of course, people still get their ideas <coughs> from, <coughs> from, uh, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, people still get their ideas from their societies. But uh, they, you know, they, these vary amongst individuals and your ability to set yourself off uh, has to do with how well you can stick to these, these things that try to set you apart. So shame is more common in some societies than others. Yeah. So for a long time, going back to the uh, famous anthropologist, Ruth Benedict, uh, anthropologists have noted that there are shame and guilt societies. And so one of the things I did and, and Ben Anke has done in his paper in the QJE is look at the real, you know, what can explain this variation in guilt versus shame. So in Ben's, Ben's paper, he finds that uh, he uses a couple different measures. One existing psychological data where people actually coded these emotional experiences of thousands of undergraduates from around the world. And you can explain that by this, by this kinship measure. Uh, and then Ben also looked at Google searches. So that research is summarized in my book. Tell people more about the relationship between shame and kinship. 
So uh, kinship societies, especially ones with intensive kinships where uh, the social structure regulates people's behavior, really emphasize shame. And importantly, it becomes more than just an individual experience. So if your brother, sister, or even a cousin does something shameful, the whole family experiences shame. So it's experienced vicariously. So I may want to regulate my brother's behavior because I'll experience shame and I'll be thought to be less of a person uh, if he does something wrong. So it, it pulls everyone together and, and gives them the same fate. Right, absolutely. So for example, in a, in a society characterized by strong family bonds, strong kinship, uh, and honor is experienced collectively, then a brother or an uncle loses prestige if there are rumors about their niece or their sister's promiscuity. And that can motivate extra policing and monitoring of women through veils and security, right. for example. So it's part of this collective identity, which comes across in shame, it comes across in concerns with honor, but it's even legal, uh, legally in many places. So if, if the son commits a crime in China uh, before the modern era, then the father could be put in jail. Yes. Okay. I'm with you. And I thought another really nice difference that you picked up on through your own anthropological work was looking at non-competitive markets and how people might prefer to shop from their kin. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so one of the basic assumptions in economics is that you can uh, disconnect transactions from other transactions and from the social relationships involved. But when I was living in this small town, there was tons of little shops that sold all basically the same stuff. And the prices varied a lot within shops that were just a few blocks away from each other. So I was kind of pondering this as I was living there for a year or nine months basically. And uh, I it began to realize that everything was driven by the social relationships that people had developed with the owners of these shops and the families of these shops. Um, some had been, you know, jilted lovers or they had different political opinions. And that was really driving the selection of shops they picked them on. It, so there was, these were much more important than the price details. And so it meant there was no way to optimize or compete on price because it was all about this long enduring set of uh, network of relationships that you know went back multiple generations so the idea here is that in some societies people might might privilege these social bonds over the cheapest price yeah so it means if you want to have competitive markets you can't have the social bonds or you can't have tight ones because okay. it's you know as soon as there's only two dentists in town and one's your brother-in-law uh the, the choice is obvious Right, I'm with you. I'm, I better, I better go there. Okay, so t so let's agree that there's this worldwide var variation in psychologies. What are the origins of, you, in your view, of weak kinship in Europe? Well, so the first thing to say is that there's lots of things that can affect kinship. So, uh, in the book, I look at how uh, irrigation agriculture and uh, paddy rice agriculture can affect the presence of clans and other these kind of relational bonds. But what I think what what led to the to Europe's particular cultural evolutionary path was that in late antiquity in the early Middle Ages, the, what became the Roman Catholic Church started systematically uh, in putting taboos and other regulatory policies that broke down Europe's intensive kinship into monogam monogamous nuclear families. Now this process took centuries, uh, but by the time we get statistical data, the beginning of the early modern beginning of early modern Europe, uh, it's clear that Europe is dominated by, and the ideal is monogamous nuclear families, no arranged marriages. So things that many people may be familiar with in the marriage ceremony, like the bride saying I do, is part of this imposition. If you attend Catholic ceremonies, there's a point at which the priest says, uh, you know, does anyone here object to the uh, matrimony of this cousin? Well, that's put in, in under Charlemagne as a way of checking for incest. So he's actually asking, uh, are, these are these guys cousins? Just to make sure before we finalize this deal. So your argument is that before the medieval period, Europe was fairly similar to Africa and Asia. And these strong kinship groups and social and economic relations were organized around these tight family bonds. But then the Western, the Western church came in, they said, no, no, you can't marry your cousin. There needs to be consent. And those who deviated from these norms were excommunicated. So they were incentivizing adherence to these new norms. Do I have that right? Uh, well, so uh, generally, so for, certainly the case with, um, with the kinship systems in Europe uh, prior to the church, there's, no, there's lots of good reasons to believe that they were intensive kin-based institutions, uh, patrilineal, uh, you know, Rome had clans, uh, cousin marriage probably varied across populations, but the language is key. So the kinship terms and languages suggest that they had intensive kin-based institutions, the kinship 
terms embedded in ancient languages in Europe looked like the same kinds of systems we see around the world. But then around the time the church arrives, the language changes. So this is telling us that this is something penetrating deep into society and not just going on among the elites because it, it alters the language. Now, the question of the degree to which this is top down or bottom up, there's certainly evidence in the historical record that there was a certain amount of top down. So various kings get threatened with excommunication over divorcing or marrying cousins. Um, William the Conqueror had to build an abbey in order to avoid this thing when he married his cousin in Aquitaine. She actually had to build an abbey too. Um, but this also may have been some trickle down. So one of the patterns we see is that when the elite adopts something, there's often a desire for people further down the, the food chain to want to adopt that thing as well. So famously, Chinese foot binding trickles down from the elite and because everybody else wants to be kind of kind of like the elite. And also you see this in name choices. So when the elite adopt new names, it then trickles down to uh, people lower down the social spectrum. Uh, so to the degree to which this was uh, sort of adopted through a cultural evolutionary process somewhat voluntarily and imposed by priests threatening uh, you with excommunication probably varied. Okay. So may I suggest an alternative hypothesis for the origins of weak kinship in Europe? So let me, okay. let me, let me, let me just, I, I'm interested in, not, so the, not that I necessarily know the answer, but I'm interested in how you process alternatives. So what about wheat, the black death and the rise of wage labor? So Europe, wheat's growing, labor had diminishing marginal returns. Over the winters, young adults were a drain on resources, a drain on their parents' resources, and they were idle. And by staying at home, these people were doing nothing, costing their parents' livelihoods. So many went out to become hired laborers, to earn their own money, to accumulate savings, and to free their families from the cost of provision. And especially in England, non-heirs went out. They left their natal homes and parishes looking for land and work. And my understanding is that after the Black Death, uh, rising demand for labor meant that there were rising wages, especially, especially in Northwestern Europe, relative to continental Europe, Southeastern Europe and Southwestern Europe. So men's exit options, their outward mobility and their bargaining power increased after the Black Death. And also what I found interesting is that by going out, men not only became more economically autonomous in that they had the money to set up their own households, but by going out beyond the natal parish, they were meeting more women. They were interacting, they were expanding their social networks. And I think what was also important when I read gendered histories of the medieval period, I see that women were seen as economic contributors. And so maybe there was more of an expectation that women would contribute to the new neo-local household, which wouldn't be so much of an expectation in South Asia, for example. So this growing market dependence, perhaps it displaced kinship as the mode of production. And okay. once, yeah, okay, inter interrupt, in in do you think- Well, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to lay that one to rest. Okay, 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 so, so two more things. So my suggestion is that one, men didn't look to their parents to inherit. And if you're not planning to inherit land or assets from your parents, why, do, why marry your spotty, smelly cousin? Why not just marry the girl that you like? And so perhaps that as the mode of production changed, parents lost influence over marriage. But tell me now, now tell me how okay. I Okay, so the Black Death hit other places too, right? So why didn't it have that effect in India and China and all the other places? Plagues and epidemics have hit lots of places, but it was only in Europe that it had this released people from the bonds of their kinship, men could move away, they could actually marriage by choice. That doesn't work in India if you hit it with a plague. It doesn't, incre it doesn't decrease the amount of arranged marriages or cause people to break off from their kin bonds. Uh, second thing is where well, there's good, there's not quantitative, well, there's some quantitative data, but there's qualitative data to suggest that the marriage and family program was already having big impacts on Europe before the Black Death. So the Black Death is relatively late in the story. So we see lots of interesting things happen um, in the data as well. Uh, so uh, there's a book called Medieval Households, which kind of lays some of this out. So stuff's happening before the Black Death. The Black Death seems to exaggerate some of these patterns, but the Black Death doesn't have this effect elsewhere. So it seems like what you're seeing is an interaction between what the church had already done and the effects of the plague taking advantage of that. Oh yeah, no, I, think, I think that's very plausible, the interaction, the, 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 the church creates this normative change, but I think the Black Death, and I would say in conjunction to crop systems, right? So in rice growing cultures, 
labor does not have these uh, diminishing marginal returns. You know, it, it, one person can stay, you know, Japan, this is like Fukuyama's famously written about this, how in Japan there was much less proclivity for workers to go out into, into wage labor because each additional person can make, can make their family rice fields more productive, which wasn't the case for wheat. Right. So if you have but, wheat and, sorry, interrupt me, yes, sorry. Well, it's just that, I mean, in our science paper, which is reviewed in the book, we hold all those things constant. And we still show that the effect of the church is by far the biggest factor explaining contemporary psychological variation. In, in. So, you know, there are small effects of the details of agriculture from that study. There are small effects of irrigation on those things. And there's a giant effect of the number of centuries under the church. But I think though, the church wouldn't so there's a question of the church created the motive, maybe, or the norm, you know, wanting to be like the elites, wanting to be like the lords. Yes, that creates the motive. But only when adults have the economic autonomy to do so, and women are seen as economic contributors, can they actually live up to that norm. So maybe the norms are important. Well, wait, the, I don't, I'm not sure. So, uh, I mean, at least if you buy Nathan Nunn's uh, argument about the plow, the plow should make women relatively weaker. And so Europe is plow dominated at this point. So if anything, the church is fighting an uphill battle relative to hoe agriculture. But in places like a Africa, where polygyny is common, intensive kinship is common, all that hoe agriculture doesn't seem to do any of this. No, I, so I'm totally with, so yes, Nathan Nunn has famously written that female labor force participation was much, much higher in Africa, and I buy that. But whenever I read uh, gender histories of Europe, women seem very much involved in European agriculture, in threshing, in harvesting. It's not like South, South Asia where women were economically marginalized from production. And I think given that women had some involvement, that likely increased men's confidence that they could start up a home alone with just this one woman. Whereas if, if women were seen as totally doing nothing, then you might not have think, hell, I can't start a family by myself. Right, right. Although the, what, I guess what we don't know is the degree to which women were able to do that because the church had already said bilateral inheritance, ending patrilineal inheritance. The church had already said no arranged marriages, marriage by choice. They allowed women to say, I do. They're doing all this in the eighth century, long before all the stuff you're talking about. Lo, lo, oh, I think women were involved in agriculture before the eighth century, but okay. All right, all right. We well, will, what's, okay. what's the evidence? What's the evidence for that? That women were involved in agriculture in Europe? Well, that they were, they were, you, you said that they were much more involved than in Southeast Asia. Or in in, in South Asia, in South Asia, in India. In I, South th Asia. Okay. I think that, I think there is more evidence of that. Okay. I don't I think th it goes th back the, before the, the, the eighth century. But... The things that I've, well, I, th I think that women were involved, maybe not as much as in Sub-Saharan Africa, but at least they were involved and that may have increased people's confidence that the young independent neo-local units could be self-provisioning, perhaps, okay. perhaps. Okay. And I think there is, uh, uh, so um, this argument isn't mine. Uh, the new book, Capital Women, by the uh, Van Zanden and the other economists at Utrecht, um, this is a claim that made, they make that women's labor force participation much higher in Northwestern Europe. Right, but uh, that's, that's endogenous, as, as the economists like to say. So the, the, you got you to gotta then ask the question, why were the women more engaged in agriculture? What was it about? I mean, if you think it's about the details of farming in, in Europe, that's what, that's what I need to know. What were the details that were different about European? And, you know, why, not, why isn't that true in Eastern Europe? Right. Okay. Okay. Well, now, yes. Now, there are some soil differences. So maybe you want to get down to the soil differences between yeah, I, that happen to correspond to the line between the Carolingian Empire and... So I have no idea. of. I, I genuinely don't know the causes. But like, for example, women's labor force participation in agriculture was much lower in southern Italy as compared to northwestern Europe. And I don't know the answer why. So there seems to be like a correlate. There is a correlate. And I, I don't know the full story. But I, I think... But th the, that can yeah. be explained by exactly the process I described, right? Yes. Now. Yes. I appreciate this. I appreciate this. But I think that it's not enough just to, for me, it's not enough just to say the church encouraged these norms. We need to think about what enabled parent, young children to have the economic autonomy. So I would say they might both be part of the explanation. Yeah, well, so I'm definitely on board. And that's one of the things the book says. Uh, it, it explains that the wheat based system in Europe and the fact that those societies had not gotten very complex, like the Celts, uh, could have made it this a process more likely to happen than on the other side of Eurasia.
Right, right. So there's a confluence of different conditions. We agree right. on that. What, what if there were evidence suggesting mm -hmm. that um, in Africa, proximity to missions led to the same process? If the people are more I like... I say that knowingly. Right, 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 right. <laughs> So what if there's evidence that people who live near, but that would make total sense. I would totally buy that because women in Africa, uh, and, and this is true, you have many more neo-local uh, nuclear families in Africa than uh, South Asia, for example, even today. And I think that's partly because of women's labor force participation. Well, it's also true that distance from a mission predicts being more polygynous. The further the way, the more likely. So, if you want to give women ones. power, you've got to end polygyny, right? Yes. Because yes. that th th does all kinds of things which make women weak. So, if the, all the missions were doing was ending polygyny, they'd make women more powerful in the household bargaining. I, I, I would be, uh, I would totally agree that it's possible that by living near a church, learning about consen uh, the norm of consensual marriage in interaction with young couples' economic autonomy. If young couples don't have that economic autonomy, they may not be able to live up to that new ideal. Is right. my only suggestion. And so what we know from the ethnography is what the church, you know, if you become a Catholic, in order to marry you, you cannot get married until you set up neo-local residence. That's a requirement, and sometimes during certain Catholic missions when they were imposing this. Right. But I, but I, and I, if you I, want to go to heaven, you got to do that. So if you care about heaven, sure, sure. Who doesn't? Okay, 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 okay. So let's agree that Europe had low kinship intensity. Now I want to know what are the consequences of low kinship intensity for growth? How did low kinship intensity affect Europe's economic development? Yeah. So the case that I make in the book is that uh, a combination of psychological shifts induced by low kinship intensity and the fact that you've lost all your social safety nets. So uh, kinship, uh, intense kinship supplies, you know, takes care of you when you're injured, your old age, it's your network, it's who you get loans from, um, all that sort of thing. So it meant that people had to go out and form new relationships. And I use this to explain the proliferation of voluntary associations in Europe that we see, say, beginning in the high Middle Ages, the spread of guilds and universities. Guilds are initially self-help societies where people banded together under the guy, under the under religion, you know, with religious overtones uh, to help each other. Uh, the emergence of charter towns, these kind of voluntary towns and cities that were forming where people opt in, become citizens, and then get rights, privileges, and responsibilities due to that. And that this is a new way of organizing things that's only possible once you uh, crack the bonds of intensive kinship. Okay, so I have a question. The UK today has um, GDP per capita of like $46,000, $48,000. And Zambia has a GDP per capita of 4000 how much of that difference do you think is explained by the variation, psychological variation and cultural evolution? Is it like 10%, well, one of the points 50%? the books makes is that it, you need to think of this as an ongoing cultural evolutionary process. So, I mean, what the church did was kind of open the door and then you had to have the emergence of these voluntary associations. And by the end of the book, I talk about how, you know, the trust in strangers and greater tolerance opens up the informational flow between all different parts of Europe and the movement of apprentices and journeymen taking knowledge from one place to another. And all this is, you know, the, the engine of innovation is recombination of ideas. And all of this creates greater recombination, which, which further drives innovation. Uh, so, you know, there's a bunch of lines, a bunch of kind of elements in the cultural evolutionary story. Uh, I have no idea what the relative contributions are. But I mean, how important do you think this is to say geography? Like uh, if, if we're exp if we're explaining the forty fold difference between Britain and Zambia, forty fold difference. To what extent do you think geography is part of that, and to what extent do you think it's the cultural evolution developments of in light? Uh, you know, well, the there's no reason to think geography is very constraining. I mean, uh, if you look at the GDP of uh, the, of North America prior to European settlement, and then a couple hundred years later, it dramatically increased. So. I mean, look at New Zealand. Uh, when you bring certain institutions, certain kinds of practices, you can generate a lot faster economic growth. Right, but it may be that geography is a background condition that enables economic takeoff with the right institutions. So for example, let me just suggest, so you know, Jared Diamond famously suggests that 
agriculture spread in Western, uh, in, uh, Western Eurasia because the soil was conducive to nutritious crops and domesticated animals. And so you had highly nutritious food and you know you better diet so when you had the Prote the protestant the the right spread of protestant which encouraged learning you then had rapid learning because people were well nourished right if you're not well nourished learning is harder whereas in africa in places like zambia where, where i've lived and people are eating cassava as the drought crop you're not going to be so well nourished partly because of the geography and if people are poorly nourished, then learning is harder. You know, if the, te if the room temperature in your classroom is 40 degrees, um, if the food prices are very high, then learning is so much harder. So I just wonder if agriculture, low agricultural productivity, for example, in Africa, higher food prices can inhibit the kind of learning that were necessary for economic takeoff elsewhere. So geography could be uh, a bad Yeah, so you, you, you had a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, right. So, First of all, the book, uh, I say that Jared Diamond was correct, and he was correct up until about a year 1,000. Uh, so you, certainly you can explain why Eurasia is different from Australia and Oceania and South America based on, I think, Diamond's, Diamond's uh, biogeographic argument makes a huge contribution. But then if you just look at the old world, uh, it becomes less clear. In Africa, you have to make some special case arguments. So you have to make arguments about zebras being different from the horses that were in North America, and that somehow you couldn't get the horses to come to uh, Africa from Eurasia, even though there's lots of people flowing there. Um, now, I certainly completely agree, and the book basically says this, is that getting better nourished can have lots of big downstream effects. Uh, because of how it affects growth and development and psychology and things like that. So that's a big part of it. You said that, that I mean, Diamond actually doesn't argue that farming made people <clears throat> better nourished. In fact, it made people less well nourished. Initially, for a long time, people got sicker and smaller until they managed to culturally assemble a package that could get past that. It's, that's not obviously true to me in uh, the, the options and opportunities. Cassava is not particularly nutritious, but um, uh, there's lots of other foods that could be that could be used to supplement that as a caloric source. Uh, so. So, uh, so, I mean, I guess I broadly agree that geography can be usually important in the, telling the long-term story. <clears throat> um, and certainly having enough food is crucial for certain kinds of development. Um, I'm not sure where that leaves us. Okay. But I mean, it's something I said, okay. But you know, for example, even if you had more say Protestant missions, for example, in Africa, in a context of climate breakdown, where you've got drought and desertification, any kind of learning or any kind of learning or any, any, or any, even economic autonomy for young couples is going to be so much harder when geography is against Africa. As I would see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, and malaria has had a huge effect on human, human evolution, uh, and certainly a, a big factor. So that's a pathogens. But remember, there was uh, malaria in England and in, in Spain, but they drained the swamps and got rid of the malaria. There was malaria in the southern US until it was exterminated. Oh, yes. A lot Isn't of it? DDT. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. So the argument is that weak kinship intensity and different psychologies are an important precursor to economic growth and catch up. Can you tell me how do you explain the more recent rapid economic growth in East Asia? Yeah, so I, I cover that in the book. And uh, I mean, you know, there's a background that did when, so Western European institutions uh, began spreading around the world. Um, China, uh, Japan, for example, in the 1880s begins a massive importation of Western institutions. They do it again after World War II, uh, not, less voluntary then. Uh, but, you know, in the 1880s, they're importing Western civil codes, and so they're ending polygyny and cousin marriage and all that kind of stuff. So they're beginning the social transformation that the church started long before that. In China, this begins, well, it begins in the 1930s, and then by 1950, laws are being made, bilateral inheritance uh, is imposed from the top down. Of course, these in, things are imperfect, but the, it's, I mean, it was imperfect when the church did it too. Um, end of polygyny, which was common among the elites in, in China, uh, things like that, foot binding ends through, through influence from Europe. I mean, the one thing, I 
I was a little bit skeptical. I'll tell you why. So for example, the Chinese marriage law or the insistence on bilateral descent, I'm not sure how well enforced those were, is my concern. Some of these things, I don't know if they were actual priorities of the state. So for example, the, the Chinese marriage law, which supposedly allowed women or, or you know, cu both couples to have, to you know, ban arranged marriages and to marry the person of their choice. As I understand it, in rural China, many sub-district and village cadres totally ignored it. And they, say, and they said that, uh, and they rejected women's applications for the divorce. And when women tried to inherit or when women wanted to divorce, they repeated the patrilineal idiom that wives were a man's property. And the CCP was so fearful of enraging the poor rural peasants their primary constituency that they actually backed off and they applied the brakes. And by 1956, I think many in the top leadership were saying, oh, this was bourgeois individualism. So many of those more progressive things were totally weakened. And, and what I also saw is that- but What about, I mean, hmm. we, we know that the Chinese government is happy to really impose things that people hate. There's the one child policy, which would have forcibly created small families, which is the key element, you know, small families. And of course, people couldn't get married polygynously. That was successful. Uh, so they were definitely getting part of the program implemented. So there was it just took the divorce and arranged marriages took a little bit longer in the rural areas, but it was more effectively implemented in the urban areas. Ah, I'll take two points on that. The urban, uh, urban marriages were not arranged even before the communists take power. Um, there's nice ethnographic work pointing out that with industrialization, with marketization, you have these young people moving to the cities, mixing and mingling in factories and in markets and finding their own partners. So that was totally independent of but the But that was already market. a product of the industrialization comes from Europe. And, it, and like same thing, like the best example is foot binding. Why did foot binding end? It's, it's the Chinese elite explicitly decide not to do it because of Western models. And they also start wearing business suits for the same reason. So they literally imitate the wearing of neckties uh, and, you know, and not foot binding their children. So that's right, other, other practices, marriage practices also flowed in that way. It's called prestige bias transmission. It's well, very well documented. Okay, so I understand those arguments, but there's a contending hypothesis. So um, I don't know if you've read um, Young Hands Bound Feet, but there's this argument that in some provinces that girls' feet were bound in order to m encourage them to do their handcrafts, to be, uh, to be working very hard in the home, make, spinning cotton and thread. And if, a girl, and if a district had cotton and um, silk weaving in homes, girls were 2.5 times more likely to have their feet bound. And when that practice died out, when the handcrafts died out, actually rural women became much, much less likely to have their feet bound because it was no longer economically advantageous. So there's a different, that was a well, sort of grassroots I mean, hypothesis, I, not there's about- no, uh, There's no doubt that, that those economics and uh, incentives matter, but one of the things I suggested earlier was that uh, this was a trickle down practice. So the elite women were not affected by those economics. The elite women didn't do any work before they yeah, sure, sure, totally. were bound and they'd do any work after. Um, so you can't tell the story for the elite women. And initially it was a trickle down practice. So once the elite women stop doing it and the economic incentives go away, why, why would you do it? So, so, so I just wanted to question the, the, the argument that it was all about stuff coming from I, did, I didn't mean to okay, suggest okay, all. Okay, okay. So but then the thing I is you got to understand how the cultural stuff, the sort of social organization, acquiring beliefs from other societies is interacting with the economic opportunities, which are also coming from outside. Okay. I, I, I totally support an interaction of culture and I'm not going to be a, a hard-nosed economics uh, e e e e e e person. Okay, so I wanted to focus, um, go back to this rural-urban distinction because for me it's really important because Chinese marriages, as you know, you have to marry outside the village. And in the rural areas, even if young adults wanted to marry their own partners, they had to marry someone from outside the village. And that was very difficult when rural people just worked in their own fields and there was a strong prohibition against sexual, sexualizing and chatting up young girls from far afield. So it was very difficult to meet potential suitors. And so my understanding is that rural marriages continued to be arranged, partly because, whereas in urban areas, yes, independent of the CCP, people were mixing and mingling and kinship was disintegrating because it wasn't an important mode of production. So 
I mean, one of the things that the government did was burn the genealogies. So that seems pretty active if you're going around burning people's genealogies. The, Avner Greif and Guido make a big deal about this. Uh, but we all know that, that those were quickly restored uh, in the 1980s. That's interesting. There's a, there's a big... That's interesting. Why would they restore them if none of, this was, none of this was important and it was just all, you know, part of the big economics trend? Why are they restoring them now? It's as if they care about the clans. So, but, but, but wait, wait, right? Yes. Um, but if you're, but then, then you have a problem because you've got a case where you've got, yes, I would totally agree with you. There is strong kinship. People did want to rekindle these gene genealogies and yet you have roaring economic growth. So isn't that a problem for your argument that we're saying that people care about kinship? China is deeply patrilineal. Arranged marriages persisted in the rural areas, notwithstanding the intervention of the strong state. Uh, you know, even under collectivization, pat uh, patrilineal con continued. People, if they wanted a private, to cultivate a private plot, they did it with their patrilineal kin. Wen Wen An has a nice book on how Chinese bureaucrats use their patrilineal networks to uh, attract new investment. So I think China is a fascinating example of a strong, intensely kinship uh, society that nevertheless experienced the economic growth. So isn't that isn't that well, difficult so to I spend a lot of time on that in the book, uh, although most of it's in the footnotes at this point, uh, discussing how you can create trust through interpersonal relationships in China. And, you know, I discussed some of the some of the normative mechanisms that can be used, Guangxi. Um, and I do think it's an interesting recombination. Uh, but I also think it's certainly the case that the intensive kinship was dramatically weakened. And, you know, it is there is divorce now and there is, uh, uh, you know, bilateral inheritance and whatnot. So it's certainly much weaker than it was. Now that doesn't mean, you know, kin, you know, intensive kinship is very resilient. I explained early in the book how it comes out of various aspects of our evolved human psychology. So it's always gonna roar back. Uh, that's the interesting thing about Europe is the church kept it in a straitjacket for so long. Um, you do see cousin marriage roaring back periodically. So uh, there's new work suggesting that the US laws on cousin marriage actually increased economic growth in U.S. states when they banned cousin marriage. Um, so yeah, so it's a constant, you know, there's a constant, you got to constantly keep your foot on, on intensive kinship. If you, if you want to generate growth through the, through the mechanisms that generated growth in Europe, there might be entirely other ways to generate lots of economic growth. So one of the mistakes, I think, is to think that there's one pathway to economic growth. And China may be creating a new cultural evolutionary pathway. I, that, that's, that sounds like, yeah, I mean, that's good good cultural evolution. Ah, so, so, so cultural evolution is smarter is than we are. Weak kinship is one pathway to economic growth, but it's not the only one. Well, of course not. Um, th lots of societies have been very successful based on intensive kinship, all uh, massive empires. I mean, Rome had intensive kinship and, you know. Okay. I'm with so you. if you look, take the long breath over human evolutionary history, some of the most uh, sophisticated societies were elites that, you know, the elites were all related and Okay, I have a question though. So going back, I suggested that part of the explanation, I don't pretend to, that the economic side of it is the whole explanation, but part of the explanation for the erosion of kinship in Europe was rural urban migration, the transition out of agriculture, non-family employment and education. And I think the same might have been true in East Asia, in South Korea, in China, in Taiwan, in Japan. And I think if you look at successive marriage cohorts, as men gained education, as men got jobs in towns and cities, as they networked more widely, as they became more economically autonomous from their parents, they increasingly chose their own partners. And very few of them wanted to marry their spotty, smelly cousins. And so what I think is that the, the kind of economic development might have eroded kinship intensity. So one of my favorite books- I just, is, just a quick, that's, yeah, that's what chapter one says. Right, right, right. You just described what I say in chapter one. So it's a, it's a, so it's a combat. So, but, but my, my argument here is that economic development might explain some of the psychological variation that you find in the world. And that's what I'm trying to suggest. Right. So I was you, trying to explain that, or, you know, I, I had a different goal, right? But, 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 so, but what do you think of this argument that, for, so for example, 
in South Korea, the state, the strong state directed finance to large firms. And then the South Korean workers, they came from very strongly kinship intensive families. Family bonds were important to them. They only thought of themselves as sons, as daughters. They wanted to show filial piety. But through working together on the factory floor, by living in dormitories together, sharing their struggles, by protesting against uh, grievances, they developed a sense of class consciousness. So through this form of culture, uh, economic development, economic development so led to culture. You seem to, uh, you seem to see economic development as something that just is one thing. The kind of economic development they're bringing in uh, notions of corporations where you hire strangers. Those evolved in Europe through the process I described. So what we're saying is that a particular set of institutions, which is one way to generate economic development, provided opportunities to break down families and, and uh, change the incentives. But then if you ask, where did those corporations come from? How, how, then you go back to Europe and you go back to the high middle ages and you're right back to the story that I laid out. So you're not, you're not laying out a different theory, I don't think. You're laying out a kind of well, what if we keep following this process and as it goes on into the world and, and the institutions that got built during the last millennia in Europe expand globally and allow people to move away from their families? Wait, so, so, so your suggestion is that but for the European experience, the South Korea wouldn't have had, that you wouldn't have had large firms in South Korea? Uh, I mean, th that... I, I don't know, but that, that model is, is you can trace the history of the model of the corporation and it goes back to Europe. I, I guess there's no counterfactual way of knowing, right? Yeah, right. Oh, so I agree. Um, so, okay, we'll agree on that. But, but, but like, so, so pick a time, right? So we can't pick the future, mm -hmm. but we can pick a time in the past. And uh, if you take 1500 or something like that, you already have corporations in... Europe, you have these towns, you have various monasteries that are organized hierarchically, strangers able to move amongst voluntary associations. Europe is characterized by its unique proliferation of these voluntary associations. They're not based on family, not based on lineage, not based on geography, um, that are not common around the rest of the world. No, so I agree, pick, I agree. pick different time slices and uh, I mean, you can begin to see a case coming together. But, but, but let, let, let me clarify this to understand our differences. I understand you are saying the medieval church weakened kinship in Europe, and this enabled non-family, non-familial associations of, of, of the people organizing together beyond the family, right? And then this led to more universal laws, for example, universal principles, and the enlightenment, innovation, and growth, right? So cultural change, economic development, crudely. Uh, well, so I don't like that causal. That's not a cultural evolutionary okay. approach, and it's one of the problems with economics. Uh, so in, in a cultural evolutionary models, you have interwoven causality, just like any evolutionary process. So culture, the church goes first in my story, and then it creates new economic opportunities. And one of the, I have chapters on the, uh, the rise of impersonal markets and the spread of voluntary associations. Those are both then economic forces, which then alter people's psychology even more. And then you have different social structure, different psychology then creates the possibility for, say, national level institutions, democratic governments, individual centered Western law, all that kind of stuff. So the whole story is an interactive process where you're moving back and forth across uh, in causal directions. I'm totally with you. So it's a sort of layering process. You need one thing which enables another, which enables another. I'm with you. I'm with you. But then once you get some of those levels, like once you get in personal markets and once you get corporations and things like that, and you have a global economic system, you can just ship those, right? And that's going to have some effect independent of the substructure. So if you have companies you can just become a member of, and that gives you an independent income, which separates you and relieves you of all those, you know, that safety net I mentioned, where you're relying on your family in case you're sick and injured, you know, you're, they, you jointly own land with them. But so if you have a company that comes in from outside, say, sets up a firm, and then you can join that firm, then yeah, you're just initiating the same process that, that I described that the church initiated, you know, back in 500. Okay, so it's just a transplanting process. Okay. I, I, I don't know enough to comment on the transplanting process. But what I will say, what, what I will say is that regardless, so, so I see what you're saying is that you would, 
agree with me that once, so you're saying you just transplant these large firms to Korea, then they have economic development and that erodes kinship. And, and also the idea. So remember that one of the things that uh, the US and, and Europe did was educate people from around the world. So you bring them to Harvard, you give them an MBA, and then they build organizations that look an awful lot like the things you taught them in class. Okay, I'm with you. But I do want to, I still, I want to push back a little bit about this idea that the strong states change the culture before the economic development. I think, I think that bit is overshadowed. So for example, tell me which bit of this you disagree with. So the arranged marriages, they weakened over successive generations. They didn't just weaken in the beginning in the 1950s. It really took until the 1970s, till the 1980s, the 1990s, where women were earning their own wages. Men were economically autonomous. They were in, they were migrated to cities, urbanization, which you talk about in your book. They were educated. And even then, the states were not were still supporting patrilineal. It took democratization and feminist activism in the 1990s to push these reluctant states to end the legal entrenchment of patrilineal and to give men custody, to give men property rights, etc. So I see it as the effect of economic development that weakened kinship and then feminist activists. But what about pushed, the, yeah. so I mean you I, I think you've already agreed that the uh, one child policy was an effective thing the government did. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm not denying that the CCP has, is very powerful. Like the well, CCP the, does the many The Chinese things. government is the most, probably the most effective state in human history. Yeah, so but if my there's only one state that could do it, it's my only the Chinese government. Yes, my disagreement was that CCP does not want to do everything. So it prioritizes things and it did but not prioritize I guess, the so Reducing families to one child alone, forget about, suppose they were completely unsuccessful with everything else. Mm -hmm. that, that's gonna do most of the work because right. if you're one child you don't have any brothers and sisters and you don't create cousins and you basically kill the whole system um and i also keep insisting that they also definitely made no polygyny but, but that, that, that to, it's not the case it's not the case about eroding arranged marriages or er, it did not erode the importance of lineage because that flourished in the 1980s it did not erode the importance of you know chinese people still trace their names back to a particular group they filial piety incredibly important and i'm not sure this claim about cousins is important because as I was mentioning Wen Wen Ang's book about people using their patrilineal networks to attract bureaucrats using their patrilineal networks to attract inward investment. I'm so just I saying that uh, if you, if you make it just exists. once, if you, if you make children with no siblings, I mean, you can do that. You can do the math. You're going to really reduce the effectiveness of intensive kinship just on that one thing alone. But that's going to be, I think it's I think it's hard to argue that that was a precursor to economic growth. I'm I'm happy to uh, I know it was a precursor to a reduction in crime. Oh really? Or uh, sorry, increase in crime. Tell me, I didn't know this bit. Uh, so it's an economic analysis um, in which you look at the one-child policy was implemented at different times in different provinces for idiosyncratic reasons, and uh, you'll then see the sex ratio is heavily male biased. Yes. Uh, and 18 years later, the crime rates go up in, in those locales. The crime rates go up when it's heavily male biased. When it's heavily male biased. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. In not, and not so the thing is, the thing about like arranged women. marriage and, and women's uh, power mm -hmm. is that by creating the one child policy, you're working directly against that. So you're actually making a family because you're, you're making women rare. Um, and that's incentivizing arranged marriage, it's incentivizing minor marriages, all that kind of stuff. So there's a bunch of other effects created by the way in which the, China, by the, way in which the culture interacted with the one child policy. So, so what's your argument? Sorry, so is it just clear, I, I'm being slow here. Explain. So um, I, I just, I mean, uh, I haven't, this is not part of the book and I didn't, I didn't get into this, but um, it seems to me there's a, a way in which uh, uh, gender equality is going to be negatively affected by the one child policy because you're creating extra males. And we know from other work that when you have extra males, that reduces female power because they become a, a, a men begin competing fiercely 
Oh, I know. Yes, this is totally true. Uh, Letha Hong you... has a book on this um, about, well, anyway, this is beyond the subject of your book, so I won't, I won't mess fat on that. But yes, there is uh, the government shames leftover women who are over 29 and unmarried um, and telling them they must marry soon. They must marry soon. You know, they can't use their scarcity power in the marriage market, but they're being shamed into marriage, for example. Uh, and there was and there's violence against. Um, women. Anyway, that's a, a, a deviation from your book. So, but what I, what, I, what I want to suggest is that both in East Asia and in Europe, my understanding is that the transition out of agriculture, non-family employment helped erode kinship intensity. And I think we both agree on that, but you, or your further claim is that the church was also important in eroding kinship intensity in Europe and that some of the reasons those things happened in East Asia were partly because firms were imported into East Asia from Europe. Is that right? Well, in, not just firms, the, the idea of firms and certain ways of organizing the economic system as when, when populations connected to the global system, when colonies were set up in some places, um, all that kind of thing. So, uh, but I guess I feel like the, a lot of the argument is based, uh, a lot of the ideas you're proposing are kind of like, picking an intermediate thing that happened. So urbanization, but why did urbanization happen? And so what I try to do is I try to follow the trail back in time and, and try to figure out those dynamics. So you're saying so that I op urbanization I open the book. only happens in weak kinship intensive societies because you need low constraints on people to release them into the world. Well, I, I hate the word modernization because what happens is a, is a particular cultural evolutionary trajectory in which you have impersonal markets, voluntary associations, free movement amongst organizations, which that just ha happens to be the way moderniza modernization happened along one particular developmental trajectory, one particular cultural evolutionary trajectory. There's certainly lots of other, potentially lots of other ways to do that. Um, so I, yeah, so modernization, I guess it's my, the cultural, cultural anthropologist in me that, that pushes back there. But, but tell me, urban, how, how would you explain urbanization in East Asia? What drove urbanization in a strongly kinship intensive societies? Well, um, there wasn't much urbanization. So, uh, I mean, 4% in China. Uh, so Europe passes China in about 1200 in terms of All right, but I mean, in the past century, what drove urbanization in the past century in these strongly in kinship intensive societies? Well, I mean, uh, uh, that's not something I focused on. And I did, I touch on it a little bit in the book, but just as a kind of point of comparison. So with the spread of European powers, the industrialization, global trade, you get rapidly rising urbanizations all over, all over the world. But isn't it just, so as, I as, as economic opportunities to engage in the global economy appear in cities. Right. But doesn't this show the importance of people's responsiveness to new economic opportunities, regardless of kinship? So correct me, interrupt when I'm wrong, but you know, so the, the kinship argument is that if you've got weak kinship, then people readily respond to new market opportunities because they're not bound by kinship, right? And perhaps that's part of the explanation of low urbanization in South Asia, maybe. But in East Asia, it seems that this is a strongly kinship intensive society. Perhaps you had less receptive, less responsiveness to new economic opportunities because of rice, where there is not the diminishing marginal returns to labor as there was in Europe. But still, when you had economic growth, which was strongly labor intensive in Japan, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in China, when you had strong demands for labor, many heavily indebted, poor, impoverished rural families saw these economic opportunities. And even though they were stro so strongly kinship intensive, they let their daughters and their sons go off to the cities they said sure take those economic opportunities so kinship even though it structured their societies as soon as there were the, there was a, an opportunity to make money people went for it so to me that suggests that you can have urbanization regardless of strong kinship uh well so i i mean i agree with that um certainly people respond to economic incentives and migrate to cities for economic opportunities that seems pretty well substantiated uh, but there are different ways to engage in cities and um, there are different, different amounts to which you can be free to move. So for example, lots of people who move to cities around the world maintain ties back to their home villages. And they still, if you say where you're from, they don't say the city, even if they grew up their whole life in that city and, and their parents came from somewhere else, they'll name that village back in, uh, on their home island uh, or their home, their home community. 
So uh, that's because they have kinship ties that take them back there. They often send remittances back to these places. This can go on over generations. Uh, yeah, so the, the kinship ties are till, still there, and they often live in uh, ethnic or enclaves or clan enclaves in towns, so they're not fully engaged in the town. Um, that, that's going to inhibit innovation. Uh, right, right. So you can have strong kinship persisting alongside urbanization and economic development. I totally agree. But what I do think is that urbanization, although compatible with strong kinship, and, you know, Chinese... Um, Chinese children, you know, going back to visit their parents in the Lunar New Year, etc., sending remittance is very important. Yes. But urbanization, and I think that's something you pick up in your in your research about psychological variation, urbanization might shift people's behavior. You expand your horizons, you associate with different peoples by going to markets. Societies can develop over time less strongly in kinship intensive practices through urbanization and economic development, like the large firms, like as a result of the large firms in Korea. Yeah. So this is what I discussed in the last chapter where I discussed the kind of psychological side of globalization where people are being pulled in one direction by the demands of intensive kinship, but then the world and the economic incentives or whatnot are pulling them in a quite different direction. So my suggestion would be that with suppose there was more economic development and more urbanization across the world, you might see very, very sim much more similar psychologies. Well, uh, so you're suggesting this kind of homogenization of psychology. But, but that might happen with economic growth and urbanization, because I think the, the urban aspect is something your yeah. own research picks up on, there's, right? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few, there's a few, I mean, I do think that the- I wouldn't you know, say homogenization, but I might say there might be more of a convergence, more convergence through economic development and urbanization. Not that- Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, but the reason is, is, is you're using these very general terms like urbanization. And I think you could have clusters of people living together in what we might call a city, but it wouldn't look anything like, uh, you know, the classical Western city where, you know, you don't have, uh, you know, so, I think you have a particular configuration of institutions in mind. Um, I don't think your cities you're thinking of look like Islamic cities uh, of the 11th century or something like that. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, there'll be some convergence to the degree to which people are adapting to the same kinds of institutions. So corporations, democratic politics, all that stuff can create some kind of convergence in people's psychology. I do think that the, we're seeing a recombination of different institutions. So we talked about China a bit, where it's a mixture of Western institutions that have been adapted to new context and old institutions that are kind of reasserting themselves. So that could create whole new forms and whole different kinds of psychology that we haven't, uh, th that are just new in the world. Yes, yes. No, I totally accept that, that there may continue to be variation and people do what matters to them in the ways that it does. But so, but I think that we can, we can, we see your evidence of worldwide variation in psychologies. And we might say that this is partly a product of worldwide differences in economic outcomes, which are th themselves partly shaped by geography, for example. So I was just offering it as an, a different explanation of your data. That was all. I, uh, I, uh, so I guess the book doesn't say it's a different explanation. Mm -hmm. The book embraces geography and I use it to, I use it, for example, in China, I think there's geographic variation or ecological variation that leads to variation intensive kinship. So then I can use that as another way of testing the theory by suggesting that you can go from suitability to rice, to more clans, to different psychological processes. I mean, remember the main interest here is psychological variation. Yes. And you have a long road to go from telling me some geographic story to getting into why people pick the rabbit and the carrot instead of the rabbit and the dog. <laughs> All right. So the, so one of the problems with these kind of, you know, vague, it's modernization or it's urbanization or it's, you know, malaria or something is you got to tell me how that gets inside people's heads and thickens their corpus callosum or gets inside people's heads and, and makes them think about themselves in a fundamentally different way. No, I think that's a good challenge. So my own, I do not have a theory about why people pick rabbits or, 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 and carrots. All I'm saying is to me, when these same processes happen across the world, whatever they are, education, non-family employment, rural urban migration, 
you get a similar trend emerging. That is this weakening of kinship. That is that is my only suggestion. I have not. I know nothing okay. about. Cats. So I think I think that's right. And the, the way the way I just want to nuance that yes. is by saying that there's this is a particular kind of economic development. It's built on a set of institutions. The corporation, the the, the governments are democratic, or at least superficially democratic governments. Now they may or may not function like democratic governments, mm. um, and you know. There's religious institutions to consider as well. So that's just one way to do it. And so it's a particular kind of urbanization, a particular kind of economic development built on a set of institutions that require certain psychologies. So the convergence in psychology that you're thinking of is because people have to conform their minds to the way these institutions structure the incentives in the world. Yes, yes. But we could imagine a kind of urbanization which called for something completely different. One of the points I make in the book is that you know, there's lots of urbanization in the Middle East, say, but communes, these kind of representative, these early forms of representative governments that proliferate through Europe, the probability of them popping up in, in the Middle East was zero. They, they never happened. But as soon as the church hits, your probability increases for each century under the church. This is Jonathan Schultz's paper. Um, that, that seems like a big difference. So you, they, nobody ever thought of having communes, or at least it wasn't accepted. They, they might have thought of it. Uh, but when you get Europe and you get the church, you get these communes. Mm, mm, mm. So okay. it's the psychology is the ultimate is the driver there, right? I mean, people thinking about the world and having different priorities. Right. Okay, mm. okay. Joe, we should call this a day. But thank okay. you very much. Wait, do you want to? I, I should let you sum up your book. Why don't you just give a one minute summary for the listener? Well, I mean, the, we talked about it at the beginning, which is the main idea is to unravel this puzzle of why there's so much psychological variation in the world and why uh, culturally European populations, cultural descendants of European populations, um, tend to have a particular psychology, why they're unusual in a global and historical perspective. And so the book kind of lays out a series of processes, only one of which has to do with the church, although they're, they're, they're sequenced the way we talked about. Um, that eventually lead to an increasingly unusual psychological pattern, which I call weird psychology. And in the book, I make the case that this has implications for the emergence of formal Western institutions, for democracy, uh, individual-centered Western law, and eventually for, for the innovation that, that propels the Industrial Revolution, which leads to the kind of phenomena uh, that Alice is thinking of. Awesome. And I would just say that's all a consequence of the form of economic development and non-family employment. But I, it's very good to talk and I've learned a lot from you. Joe, thank you very, very much. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Alice. Right, Joe, I will pause it there. Um, then if you are put, I'll stop my garage band. That was great. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Yeah, sure. But I didn't really understand your idea. Tell me. So what, I mean, where does this economic development come from and why didn't it happen before and why did it only happen in some places but not others? Is it just geography? No, I don't believe it was just geography. No, I okay. don't believe, you know, geography, institutions, a whole bunch of stuff, right? Okay. But I was just giving that as one example that's not cultural. Okay. So I guess I haven't convinced you that it all, it's all cultural. Uh, no, I'm not. So let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Wait, we should so record this bit. We should, we, should, we should record this bit too. Are you still recording? Give me your uh, one. I, I actually should run. But I mean, okay. if you look at elites around the world who mm. are rich and industrialized, mm. look at mm. the House of Saud or look at uh, elites throughout the Middle East. They're doing arranged marriage. They're doing cousin marriage. They're doing all the old stuff, even though they're brilliantly rich. They have industrial technology. So, I mean, that would seem to me to be a good culture argument. How is this a counter argument against me? Well, I thought that you were suggesting that, you know, people start doing things differently when uh, economic opportunities present themselves and uh, they, people get money. Because one of the common arguments is this is just people getting rich. When people get rich, they stop marrying polygynously, they have fewer children, etc. But my argument isn't just about wealth, it's about non-family employment. So, for example, in India, where you've got a lot of family businesses, that binds people together. If you're working together as a family, that but reinforces the, family. That just first. leads you back to the question of why is there so many family businesses there? And when Indians move to the U.S., they're in a completely different economic environment. They still start family businesses. Right. You can predict the family businesses based on the int intensive kinship back in the home country in the second generation immigrants. Yes, but in some cases you can get strong state action, strong state intervention, which weakens, which sets up the large firms like here in South Korea and Japan. And then when you have the workers on the factory floor working for those large firms, 
that we can, whereas contrast with Taiwan, Taiwan, very similar to Korea, but you had these small family firms. So I think that helps explain why you didn't have the strong militant labor movement or the strong militant democracy okay. movement in Taiwan. I got you. Everyone's okay. working for these little Yeah, that, 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 makes, that makes sense to me. And, and, and yeah, so fun. I would never say economic growth fosters cultural change in the Inglehart okay. and Norris say, no. Gotcha, okay. Just <laughs> making sure you're not one of them. You, I know you've got to teach, but Joe, this was a pleasure. But next yeah, you time too. It'll, be, it'll be in Cambridge, all right? Excellent. All okay. right. See ya. Bye.